All right, I think we'll get started. Um, thank you for um, coming in and enjoying some breakfast. Um, so just to begin with, I want to just go through kind of the, the housekeeping type of things, such as um, the toilets are actually out um, past reception. So if you need to avail yourself of the facilities, um, just go via reception and they're just to the left as you go out the door opposite the lifts. If there's any sort of emergency, you'll be given instructions as to what to do. Duck and cover, um, as they said back in the day. Um, in terms of um, uh, sponsors, I uh, want to thank IBM for kindly providing these facilities and also supporting um, the Accelerate program. Uh, also, Certus Digital, who are a major sponsor, um, who are effectively underwriting this activity, along with the University of New South Wales uh, Business School or the Australian Graduate School of Management. Um, some of the other partners that are here today are Cognition, are Unique, uh, so the digital human people and feedback avatars. And we also have uh, Intergile uh, as a sponsor today. Um, if you want to follow what's going on, you can join the conversation with the hashtag um, Digital Human Project. And if you want to follow what's going on on Instagram, uh, so this is a little bit of a, a different spin on a business project, as we're actually building, as we're building the um, Digital Human uh, avatar. We're actually documenting the journey on Instagram. So if you go to at Digital Human Project on Instagram, you can actually follow the progress of the build of the, the digital human. So today, what we wanted to um, talk about is we've got a briefing session here, which is roughly 90 minutes. We're about seven minutes late. So um, I can see somebody's already following. Somebody in the room here is followed on Instagram. Um, uh, we will be talking first of all on embarking on the digital journey, so a little bit of a roadmap about how organisations are becoming more digital. Uh, and then uh, we'll be talking about how digital assistants are changing what's possible in an operational environment. Uh, so in asset intensive industries, engineering, places that you don't really expect to see digital humans or virtual assistants. Then we're going to also have a, a little talk and a demonstration um, from our friends at Feedback Avatars on the changing face of user and customer engagement. So how digital humans and uh, virtual assistants are changing how you can engage with customers. Um, then we're gonna have a short break uh, and there's a workshop. So this will be a hands-on workshop where we'll actually potentially divide you into three groups and you can work on three different um, uh, parts of the project if you're interested in coming along on the journey around the build of uh, Digital Human. Um, but Amanda is going to do a deeper dive into what actually is a virtual assistant or digital human. Uh, and then Max the Sierra will be talking about how you undertake digital transformation within your organization. And Craig Parnham will be talking um, about design thinking and applying design thinking tools to this process. And then we break out into the workshops. Uh, and uh, lastly, we'll give you uh, an overview of next steps, tools, and resources. So if you want to get up to speed uh, with the Accelerate program, uh, you can do so by following the QR code that's here. Uh, and there is a social learning uh, portal which has been kindly put together by the University of New South Wales, where all of the material that we have uh, recorded from previous events is available there. There are actually four masterclasses up on that social learning platform uh, on a variety of different topics around digital leadership and adaptive leadership. Uh, so I'd encourage you to take a look at that and uh, get in there and join the community. Uh, it's a great opportunity to get graduate level um, uh, thought leadership and access to thought leadership and courses. Um, and it's also where we'll be documenting some of the journey that we're going on. So the idea of this social learning platform is it's a living, breathing community so that we can actually um, put additional masterclasses. You'll also find today's session also on that social learning platform. So 
if there's anywhere that you want to go to get slide decks, um, see videos, um, gain access to resources, it's all there. Um, so I'm going to kick off um, and then Gavin is going to um, be talking about uh, this process of embarking on a digital journey and a roadmap to becoming a digital business. So um, I, I guess one of the things that we're seeing increasingly is this idea of science fiction um, suddenly becoming or progressively becoming science fact. Uh, anyone has it a guess as to whether this is a real picture? Say yes or say no. Is it just an animation or is it something that was really taken? No? So this is actually the view out of the International Space Station and this creature that you see floating here is a real thing. And I'll introduce you to Simon now. Hello, I am your space companion. So Simon is a collaboration between Airbus and IBM. And interestingly enough, last Saturday, the uh, companion, the astronaut that took Simon up into the ISS for the first time was interviewed on the national program on Saturday morning. Um, so um, apparently um, one of the first tasks that they asked him to do, he told a joke or, or believed that he was um, being asked to do something that was a joke. So there is a bit of a journey to go on, but the purpose of Simon is not so much to replace a human being in space, but to augment what they're doing there. So essentially become a companion to help with experiments to help with um, maintenance procedures um, that there are on the ISS. So there are all sorts of different things that, um, so, uh, so the objective of the project was to investigate the current capabilities of AI in complex environments such as the ISS to, uh, in order to provide the best possible support for people working in such conditions. So probably the most hazardous environment we can be in is space, where there's no oxygen and there's a lot of gravity that will um, take you somewhere else if you're not careful. Um, so uh, Simon is a real world example of a virtual assistant or essentially a version of a digital human that is in use today and is being developed and uh, is growing in consciousness, if you like. So that kind of sets the scene for today. I just want to touch for a moment on what is Accelerate, this program, why we're here, and what it is that we're here to do. So one of the things that we're seeing um, uh, these days is the rise of digital platforms. And so Accelerate is a program that's been put together to help you navigate digital platforms combined with how ecosystems are coming and forming around these platforms and uh, they are interdisciplinary in nature. So today as an example of that, we're bringing together an ecosystem of partners to help leverage a platform, uh, be it Watson, be it IoT, be it uh, other forms of application stacks 
so the dig a unique digital human platform is our platform that we're bringing to life and using an ecosystem approach, bringing together different disciplines. But one of the things that's very fundamental around technology and digital transformation in particular is that it is also about taking leadership, digital leadership or adaptive leadership, as we navigate times of rapid or exponential change, which we exist in today. So Accelerate combines three, these three uh, ingredients, if you like, to help you navigate digital transformation and um, the, the new world order, if you like, that we're currently starting to occupy. So just a word on digital platforms. Um, you know, one of the most obvious examples of that is Am Amazon and how it's transformed retail and uh, e-commerce. It's, it's now a platform where if you are a shopkeeper, you can go and you can start to build out a whole supply chain, a whole customer experience. Uh, so it's underpinning a considerable amount of change. Another platform that you don't think about terribly much is YouTube. It's the largest central broadcaster there is in the world. Um, one of the most popular channels in 2018 was Ryan's Toys, and that vlogger made $22 million off the back of YouTube, vlogging about toys and the, the um, unboxing of toys. So it's creating all sorts of new opportunities in terms of how we create value and how we monetize relationships. So uh, YouTube is a really good example of how, and Instagram actually is a really good example of how social influencers are monetizing relationships in ways that we'd never thought of before. Um, and then you have other platforms such as Watson, so providing IoT, artificial intelligence, um, in order to uh, actually accelerate what goes on in the background. So these are just three examples of digital platforms that I believe are actually going to make a substantial difference in our day-to-day -day lives, some of which are already making a difference in our day-to-day -day lives, and others are going to have a greater impact over time. Um, then we have interdisciplinary ecosystems. The reason why we get together as a community and in an ecosystem is so that we can um, apply different methods and frameworks. So design thinking is an example of a method and a framework that we can use to solve business problems. Um, also, it's a way that you can bring together industry know-how. So there's a lot of specialist knowledge that could be tied up in uh, a heavy industry, a manufacturing uh, industry, for instance, or the telecommunications industry. So you want to be able to get the benefit of collective in industry knowledge. And that's one of the things that platforms are enabling. They're connecting all of these different pieces of plant and equipment together so that you actually access a more complete data set when you're applying artificial intelligence to decision making or decision augmentation. So um, bringing together industries and then the capability sets that you also need to bring this together. So you need different skills around these different digital platforms. So um, there's a uh, capability that didn't exist 10 years ago, and that's a digital marketer. Today, you know, it's actually quite hard to find digital marketers. Data scientists have been around for some time, but those of you who are in the industry know how hard it is to get data, data scientists. And so um, that, that capability set that you need to draw on is part of how this all comes together. And when we talk about digital leadership, the, um, one of the things that we, we go to first of all is about mental ability, so IQ. Yes, digital le leadership is about learning things at a factual level and at a head level but it's also about coming together as a community. So collectively, the connections that you make in an environment like this enable you to accelerate effectively how you take leadership, how you become part of the transformation that we're in the process of. The other aspect of it is about the practice. You know, it's practicing these tools. It's about practicing the use of these frameworks. It's about day-to-day -day practice as well, because 
our roles are evolving and changing. And so we need different practices that we need to put in place or disciplines to be able to be effective digital leaders. So I want to talk for a moment about an everyday activity that we kind of take for granted, although um, we're unlikely to be driving in Manhattan. I've done it once. I probably don't want to repeat it. It's quite a, a scary experience. But when it comes to the automation of an everyday activity like self-driving cars, it's a process. It's a journey that we're going on. And there are a whole lot of components that come together uh, that enable or will enable uh, a self-driving car to come together. In the first instance, it will be about enhancing or augmenting human driving capability. And how that occurs is through sensing, sensing what's going on. If you th we, we take for granted the function of driving, but what we see, what we hear, what we touch, all gives us feedback that enables us to sense the world as we drive, which we then, using our brains and um, uh, our instincts, if you like, we understand what contextually a pedestrian walking across a pedestrian crossing means, and then we respond to that situation. But there's a continuous feedback loop around this going on. So you, know, you don't drive in a linear process, it's a constant, ever-changing set of circumstances where you're sensing, understanding, and responding to that situation. So we've developed a little model here to, to help um, put that in perspective. So if you think of an infinity diagram, um, the, the first step, as I've described, is this idea of sensing, then you have understanding, and then you've got responding. And then you sense again, you understand, and you respond. It's a continuous process that we're going through in terms of digitizing organizations and creating digital systems and intelligent digital systems. Sitting at the heart of sensing and that understanding side of things is IoT, or the Internet of Things, and um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So these two things together are actually creating quite a, a massive transformation going on. The power of being able to apply machine learning as well as whole ranges of sensor data are changing what's possible. And today what we wanted to talk about though is the thing that's going on at the intersection of all of this, which are virtual assistants. The virtual assistants are the way in which we're augmenting ourselves to be able to make better decisions, to be able to interact with those sensors, the, the digital world effectively that has, is coming about and knowledge bases. So this is a very simple model for understanding the process of becoming um, digital. And we'd suggest that there are five core interwoven elements that come together, uh, almost like category five cable, anybody that's um, familiar with that. There's twisted pairs in there and there's shielding that goes around that cable. Those different components, the first and most important actually is security, in my opinion. The second is the data that's flowing through that um, strand or that, that, that cable, if you like. And then there's three core things that are going on around systems development, which is processes, myths, methods, tools, and practices. So agile is an example of systems development. And then you've got this infrastructure that's coming together to support these new systems in the form of 5G, um, enhanced information management, cloud computing. And then the fifth thing here, which is probably the most important thing from a foundational standpoint, is mindset and culture. You can't effectively create change in a digital sense without working on the mindset and culture, not only of your organization, but of the broader community, if you're a participant in the marketplace. So this is a... a basic model for understanding these things, and I'll just break down the sensing part a little bit more, coming back to that self-driving car. There's an enormous amount of data that is now being collected in modern-day cars that is around 
uh, the sensors and devices that you have on there, so from parking sensors to radar that's incorporated in many modern day cars. Um, there are also interpretive algorithms that are applied in that sensing process to um, make some sense of those um, different, um, uh, that sensor data. Um, and then there's a bunch of con contextual information which becomes important in the sensing process. Could, it could be anything from temperature to wind conditions or uh, you know, moisture levels, for instance, or levels of corrosion in a particular um, object. So when we talk about sensing, it's a very broad set of things. Could be visual recognition, for instance. Could be language, natural language processing. And from an understanding standpoint, there's a couple of things to, to uh, grasp here. Um, so it's about accessing the accumulated knowledge that there is. So over the course of human history, we've accumulated a lot of uh, knowledge and experience, which some of which has been documented, other of which we're actually in the process of capturing. Um, the second thing is around the contextual models that we need to understand something. So what's the difference between a dog and a cat, for instance? You know, machines don't necessarily know the difference, whereas instinctively we do. So you need different contextual models to be able to make sense of the world. And then there is the process of ongoing learning, which is what we're seeing with artificial intelligence and machine learning in particular, is that there's a continuous cycle of understanding uh, going on in uh, response to sensor data and inputs and um, different outputs from the system as well. So when it comes to responding, uh, and this is the world of virtual assistants, at its most basic, uh, a virtual assistant, a virtual assistant is your browser or Google. You know, when you Google something, it's to help you make a decision. And that could be about where to buy a widget, or it could be about which movie you want to go and see this evening. So you've got um, dashboards and uh, network operating systems and live um, business intelligence dashboards that are assisting you virtually in your decision making process. Then there's another realm which is around physical augmentation. So this is the realm of robots and assisted uh, biomechanical systems that are supporting us, assisting us effectively but it's about physical augmentation. Third category are around virtual assistants, which is everything from a chatbot to an Alexa to a digital human. So there's a range of different options depending on the context in which you are trying to build an application in which these make sense. Okay. So that is just a, a brief explanation of how this model comes together. And I want to leave you with one uh, little um, key thing here, uh, an intellectual takeaway, if you like. The combination of uh, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, and virtual assistance is the intersection between Metcalfe's law and Moore's law. Now, I imagine that many people here will have heard of Moore's law. Yes? Okay. How many have heard of Metcalfe's Law? This will be a real giveaway for somebody that comes from a telecommunications background. So Metcalfe's Law is that the, uh, the effect of a network is the square of the number of users that there are in that network. So it was first used to describe how telecommunications networks, um, the reach of telecommunications networks, but with the advent of the internet, what we've seen is an explosion of the impact or the effect of the internet. So you combine the square of all of the users that there are on the internet with Moore's law, where processing power and computing power is doubling in capacity or capability year on year, uh, and, well, sorry, every 10 years. Uh, and you're going to see an explosion of, or an exponential change in the impact that these things are having on our everyday lives. 
So it's going to help us make better decisions, and this is actually a point that a chap called Thomas Siebel uh, made uh, in relation to this, this idea of Metcalfe's law and Moore's law. So we're going to be able to make decisions faster, we're going to have more information at our fingertips, we're going to be able to make better decisions because we're able to access not just more information, but more relevant, meaningful information. The other thing that it's going to enable us to do is execute processes much more efficiently. So we're going to be able to drive ever greater efficiency gains with the combination of IoT, AI, and virtual assistants. The third thing that it's going to drive is market differentiation. So in other words, new business models will be able to evolve out of the combination of these things. So how you pay for things, how you consume things, will in, in uh, most likelihood be inexorably changed by the combination of IoT, AI, and virtual assistants. So we've seen that start to um, uh, come into play with the likes of Airbnb and Uber. They're obvious examples of that, but Netflix is another way in which we've, the, the model for how we consume uh, information, video content has inexorably changed as a consequence of these things coming together. You know, so one of the things about Netflix in particular is the amount of data that is being collected there. It's actually a big data play, Netflix. It's not a streaming um, service, in my opinion, but that's a little bit of an aside. When we talk about market differentiation, what we're starting to see is the opportunity for hyper-personalization of experiences. Uh, and so an example here is Petra Baselli teaching math. How many here had difficulty with math as a, as a kid? Just a few that are willing to admit it. <laughs> Um, so you think about the infinite patience of a digital human when you ask the same question over and over again. The fact that that digital human could be teaching you math at any location at any time, uh, you know, so 24 by 7. So there are incredible opportunities for hyper-personalization that are coming from the combination of these different things. Now I want to ask one more question. How many, of he, how many people here would say that they are from the experience generation? How many of you think that you've got kids that are from the experience generation? A few hands. How do you like your coffee? That's an experience that you probably had on your way here that defines your generation, how you actually want to have your coffee, what you do in the Air New Zealand lounge, how you, which seat you prefer on an aeroplane, what type of car you drive, they're all experiences. So we often start to think of the next generation as being um, you know, the avocado toast generation you know, the experience of avocado toast because it's healthy and it's, um, uh, you know, good for you, shall we say. We all want experiences. So one of the things that digital humans have the opportunity to generate in virtual assistants is an entirely different experience generation. So you're going to be generating experiences which potentially are hyper-personalized. So with that thought, I'm gonna to pass to Gavin, who is going to talk about the face of conversational AI. <laughs> Thanks, hi everybody. Um, good to be here with you this morning. So my name is Gavin De Steer. I'm uh, from Unique, and we look at, uh, um, I, I believe, customer experience. That's the way we like to define what we do. Um, end user experience for our customers. So my responsibility is looking after customer success, making sure that the projects that we implement are successful for our customers. And uh, it's the name Unique, I mentioned some of you might be familiar with FaceMe. That's what we were formerly known as. 
And uh, we've, we've recently, in the last few months, had a, a rebrand strategy, part of our um, go global expansion, uh, making sure we're re ready from a trademark perspective, etc., and also making sure that we encompass what it is that we do, which is ultimately creating unique experiences for our customers. So in terms of uh, what we do, digital humans, but um, we like to see ourselves as the face for conversational AI. Now, having a look at that slide, the first time I saw it, um, you know, it's one of those numbers you're not sure you want to believe, that in 10 years, um, only 15% of interactions customers will have with brands will be with a human. And you say to yourself, well, that's probably what you thought when we watched some of these movies uh, two or three decades ago, talking about AI. That, if you spin it on its head, that's 85% of conversations between customers and a business and the brand is going to be done with a non-human. And that's quite intimidating if you think about it. But um, at the end of the day, these are the studies that are coming through. And if you look at where we're going and which businesses and which industries have been early adopters and how that is totally permeating all uh, forms of society, we look at social media and how many chatbots there are as well and how many companies are starting up um, that are focusing in this conversational uh, AI space, we know that this is what's going to happen. But I think ultimately what we're trying to say with a slide is that I think as opposed to being intimidated by this and looking at ways in which we can prevent this from happening, I think the way business should approach this um, in, in, uh, in society is to say what is the best way that we can implement something like this, this in terms of this change. Yes, sure. I'm not sure exactly what the figure is at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, this is a study done by Gartner. Yeah. Right, in terms of uh, um, communication, emotional connection, I think uh, when we traditionally think of face-to-face, -to -face, two human beings, uh, there's, there's words going on, yes, but it's far more than just words. When we look at emotional connection, there's, there's a tone element in the way that we speak, how, you know, the way we say something, and of course uh, the visual side of things, the body language, and of course with digital humans, um, we're looking at facial expression. Now, I think we know this is true in our personal lives. I have a 17-year-old daughter, and she's really great at stringing some beautiful words together, um, you know, giving me answers to things. But it's the way that she says it and that look in her face at the time um, that gives me the real uh, answer that she's, she's trying to give me. So I think we, we understand that in our personal lives, in our conversations with people, but in business, this is vitally important as well, that we don't lose connection and engagement with consumers' expectation and, of course, our brand values. So why are we here? What are we trying to achieve? So ultimately, we are trying to allow creatives, creative people, creative companies to build amazing products on the best digital human platform on a global level that can solve real problems. Uh, problems that we're sitting with in society today. Education is, is a big one. Um, many of us are privileged to be able to have teachers, to sit in front of teachers, etc. Not everyone has that privilege. So it's solving that at scale. And solving problems that are in, in a people-focused way, which is important, trying to keep the humanity side of things um, in that conversation. And that ultimately connect with people in a natural and human-like way. And that is the ultimate goal, to benefit the world, to, to I think, improve the condition of mankind as a whole. And I think what's important about this slide in terms of a takeaway is that I think traditionally when we think of conversational AI, we think of large enterprises and companies adopting this, let's say the, sector, the healthcare sector. Um, but ultimately, if you're looking at this being the vision, something that is across all industries at the end of the day. And it's a social responsibility. It's not always about return on investment, but of course return on impact as well. So what are we trying to achieve? So, so brand, from a business perspective, that, that brand is ultimately everything. And if you look at conversational AI in its many forms today, there's a lot of it is just repeatable. It looks the same. So when consumers interact with their brands, uh, it looks very similar to, to another business you may have interacted with a few minutes ago or, or yesterday. But the moment you start introducing face to, to the conversation, 
that becomes your unique face. Nobody else can use that face. Nobody else um, will have the same voice. Uh, also in terms of the personality, how that personality is brought across to, to your consumers, carrying those brand values, etc. And there's various ways. You, you could have a, a quirky type of personality, very jokey depending on the environment and the situation. You could have a, quite a serious one. I think if you think about giving um, you know, high wealth customers advice, uh, they typically don't want to, to a few jokes and things like that. It's got to be quite serious. That's got to be quite believable. And of course, if you think of the healthcare industry, um, education as well, there's got a lot more empathy involved in, in that particular conversation. And then trust is very important. Um, ultimately, that's what we're trying to, to achieve as well. And that's not just trust with our customers and, our, and the, with the ability of our platform to deliver on the promise and the solution, but also uh, making sure that the, our customers' users can trust the solution have a repeatable experience, a good experience. Um, that's ultimately what all companies are looking for. And we know that, that will eventually lead to, to good reports when it comes to the experience and the repeatability of that experience in that particular use case. People wanting to return, and of course, ultimately building a relationship um, with that form of communication. So S Sam uh, showed you a picture of, of Mia. So he's already of introduced her in terms of the face. So this, so Mia is the face of Eubank in Sydney. So she is uh, a digital human that looks after home loan uh, pre-qualification side, side of things. So if you are a user who's, or customer at least, that's interested, or per, per, perhaps a potential customer that's looking at a, a, a getting approval for either an existing or a new home loan, um, Mia will be on the page to help guide you through that process. You can ask her a whole lot of questions around um, interest rates and various questions that you ask to put in with regards to the, um, the application itself. Now, Ubank being a digital only bank saw this as a, as a great opportunity for them to continue to engage and interact with their customers on an emotional level. Now, other examples are the top uh, um, left hand corner there is Vodafone, that's their digital human that they created initially for a branch experience, looking at more of a return on investment type use case, prepaid top up was the concept. On the top right hand side, that was a use case that we put together around a cardiac coach, so it's a, it's a health coach. And the thinking there is, is pretty much around post-operative. So people have gone through a very traumatic experience uh, with having heart problems, and uh, some of them result in surgery. And of course, there's a whole lot of do's and don'ts after surgery, and you tend to forget. Uh, it's a nervous time. And you also tend to break the rules. Uh, they tell you no more lamb chops, as an example. And you tend to have one, now you think you're dying because you woke up that morning and you're not feeling so great. So it's not everyone, like I say, is as privileged to, to just climb in their vehicle and go and see their GP. So this is where the, you know, the return on impact is so high in terms of the, society, the, the impact on society where you make this accessible to, to more people. And of course, it's in, a, in the confines of your own home. Um, traveling is sometimes a challenge as well. And then on the, the bottom uh, uh, left-hand side, I think you might recognize the face, most of you. So John Kerwin. So um, he was one of the co-founders of the company Mentimia. Um, he's very passionate about helping people with mental health issues. And of course, um, they're busy with a process at the moment of developing uh, a digital human. And in fact, this digital human is going to look exactly like him. So he's been sent into a studio and he's been scanned, etc. So um, watch the space for more information. And then on the bottom right hand side, this is an initiative for the company um, All Is For All. It's around fashion and making fashion accessible um, and inclusive. So it's inclusive for everybody and making sure that in, in a nice frame you can describe garments, explain to people that potentially wouldn't have the opportunity to visit stores as easily, wouldn't be as mobile for various reasons, um, and pretty much creating an exclusive uh, and inclusive and accessible use case. Okay, uh, how it all works. So you've got a, a user that's interacting with our digital human platform, so our digital human itself, and you've got video and audio streams that are flowing. That information then comes through to our platform where 
from a speech to text perspective, we can convert it into a transcript and then send it through to any NLP or chatbot framework. And you can have multiple as well plugging in. And this is where I'm so important to make sure that we have the right partners, system integrators, not only working directly with ourselves, but directly with our customers. And then underneath that platform, you would have what is called an orchestration layer, which ultimately plugs into our um, APIs, into our, into our um, platform. And then on the other side of that is all the integration opportunities, which are pretty much limitless in terms of what you'd uh, want to plug in. Now, it can be hardware, access control. You can have a digital human, which we've got a, a customer that's going live. Um, in fact, I think it went live yesterday. Yeah, so customer in Melbourne, Pace, they went live, so we can talk about them now. And um, so they've got a, an, an apartment uh, a building block, which they, they, it's a new block, so it's te techno savvy. And uh, the idea is there that you can engage with uh, your customers through a digital human 24 seven, also delivery services. People come there with a parcel, once delivered to someone's door, uh, or perhaps to some central point, perhaps could be cold storage. And the beauty of it is this is fully integrated then into the access control systems, the, um, the speaker systems, or, uh, what do you call those? The intercom system, there we go. And um, so, so that's on the hardware side. So there's so many different things that you could do. And of course, integrating into calendars is, is also a big one, of course, you know, in terms of personal assistance. Um, telecommunication systems, like Genesis as, as an example, which many large enterprises use plugging in there, making sure that we can have proper handover if you eventually want to hand over to a live agent for whatever reason. And of course, like the CRM systems, Salesforce. We've done an integration with Salesforce as well and with uh, AWS in terms of using their knowledge base for their customers. There's a whole lot of information there. So ultimately, whatever you plug it into, it's going to be put through the, the um, digital human platform and that information is then relayed back to the, the customer or the end user in a very human-like way. So you're gonna have all sorts of, um, let's say emotions, smiles, and perhaps even a wink, if that's what you're looking for. So, what could possibly go right? That's not normally the way the question is asked. It's normally asked the other way, what, what could go wrong? I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of concern around AI, uh, taking over jobs and things like that. But I think the way we see it, and I really do believe thinking about this, if we think of the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of nervous people back in the day about these machines taking over our jobs and things like that. It is slightly different in the software world, but um, if, you, if you look at about enhancing human performance, um, automating the mundane, and freeing up creativity, there's many tasks that staff don't like doing. I mean, if we think of email, how many of us would surrender email and go back to handwritten letters? I mean, email didn't take over our jobs, it enhanced it. And, and this is the way we need to start looking at these things. So replacing the mundane repetitive tasks, ultimately allowing human beings to do what we're good at and what we like doing, innovating, creating, leading, designing and solving problems. Okay, so this is ultimately why we're here today, looking at taking these steps, still early days, bleeding edge, cutting edge technology, where we have opportunities like these to, to discover or identify problems, to discover, define, develop, deliver, and ultimately provide solutions. And of course, as Sam said, this is an iterative uh, process as well. I'm going to uh, use the opportunity now to do a quick demo. I don't know how many of you have seen a demo of a digital human before. Oh boy. with the notes on it, doesn't want to, yeah. Hey there, I'm Sophie. 
I've been trained to show you some of the capabilities of digital employees. Should we try a loan application? Yes. Great. I eat loan applications for breakfast. I just need a few key things from you and I can pass you on to one of my teammates to authorize the application. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, great. To begin, can you explain to me how you plan to use the money? I'd like to take my family on a vacation. Ah, uh, don't be silly. <laughs> okay. Actually, what I'd prefer you do for this audience, just to, to get some laughter, is why don't you tell us a joke? I was wondering why the ball kept getting bigger and bigger, and then it hit me. That's a dad joke, right? <laughs> do you enjoy your job? I love what I do. I can change my hair whenever I want, and I get to meet cool people like you. <laughs> okay, so you can see how she's been developed and designed is very quirky and fun, and of course this can, you know, change on your application. Thank you, Sophie. Happy to help. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.